further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. William Merchant. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Deborah, for that lovely introduction. Yeah, I do, I did do all those papers. Um, and, you know, being a, being a professor, you're generally advised to focus on one field. It's sometimes it's different, difficult for a statistician or a methodologist because many people hire you to do different things. And so what I'm gonna be talking about here is, how do you take a variety of fields, a variety of topics, and how do we as methodologists, I can work in geology, I can work in psychology, I can work in healthcare, I can work in little, literally any field. I don't need to know the specifics about how those fields work. All I need to do is find patterns in them and apply statistical methods or pattern recognition or systems theory to it. So, uh, you know, my title's called Decoding Your World. Um, I'm gonna be asking a lot of questions, and I'm gonna be asking so many questions you might end up wondering, do I actually know anything? Because I'm gonna be asking, mostly I'm gonna be asking questions. So, you know, I'm just gonna start, what is decoding? You know, I, we all have these very obvious words, and I've got, you know, someone who's in one of my classes, and he'll, he'll tell you, I'm always sort of asking these simple questions, like what does decoding mean? We always use these words all the time, but it's actually very difficult to articulate what decoding is. So, think about, you ever got a box of cereal, you might have had a decoder ring. What does a decoder ring do? Well, what it does is you have a, you have a mess of symbols and they don't mean anything. And when you look at a complicated situation like someone's mental well-being, a hospital, a school, anything that's complicated, you need to decode it. You need to take this mess, find some structure and find some patterns. So hopefully we're gonna do that. So I say decoding your world, who wants to know? Yes, that's a very important aspect. Who's asking the question? Why are they asking the question? That's actually more important than the question itself. So we'll get started. I'm going to start, who wants to know? Well, I guess we can start with me. I'm gonna say, who am I? Huh? That's not a picture of me, is it? No, that's not. Okay, that's actually a, uh, an Indian sage, um, Asian Indian sage named Ramana Maharishi. He, uh, he talks about this philosophy or this meditation called Atma Vichara, which is a who am I self-inquiry meditation. So you start off saying, who am I? It's a very basic question, so I'm gonna start this with myself because in the world of research, you don't have anything if it's not defined. If you don't know what you're talking about, you can't communicate about it. So I'm gonna say, who am I? Yes, it's a very basic question. Um, what do I mean when I, say, when I say I? When I say who am I, essentially I'm saying who is. So let's ask these questions together. So who is the person in front of you right now? Well, you know, you see me, you don't really know me yet. Maybe you will by the end of the night. But you know, who is speaking right now? This is a question I'm literally asking. Do you really know who I am? Do I even know who I am? You know, let's follow some logic. So yeah, this is a doc talk, so yeah, I'm a professor. So let me just say, who is a professor? If I'm asking myself this question, literally, of course I have these ideas related to myself. I'm a professor, I'm a dad, I'm all these things, but if I do the self-inquiry method, the practice is, I ask myself, who is asking this question? Who is a professor? The most logical answer is I am. So, okay. So, but this professorship is attached to my body. A next very logical process is this, who am I? Well, okay, well, if I'm not a professor, um, I must be in my physical body, right? Sure, I have a brain, I have blood, I have lungs, I have you know, everything that makes a human a human. But in actuality, the part of my mind that is saying I'm a body, um, to a certain extent, exist independently in my mind of my body. I'm not saying physically in an objective sense, but what I am saying is the part of me that talks to myself appears to be somewhat independent of the body because it perceives the body. Essentially, to perceive something, you need to be outside of it to observe it objectively, right? If you're in the thick of something, you can't really think of it. If you're involved in your emotions, you can't look at them objectively, you have to step back. So if I'm perceiving my body, there must be a part of my mind that subjectively is separated the perception of my body. So if I'm, who is this body? I just have to say, I am. Okay, well, who's having these thoughts? I'm thinking I am, I'm wondering these things about myself. I have this internal dialogue. So the next logical step is who is thinking these thoughts? All I can really say is I'm thinking these thoughts. I have a body, I'm a professor. So what I'm saying as we go through, this I am is the root of essentially my consciousness. That's what this Atma Bachar is about. So who's asking? Eventually you say, who, who am I, who am I? Um, who's asking the question? I am, that's always the answer. So now the last question is who's saying I am? Who in my head keeps saying I am? Literally, who am I? I? Literally, I can't answer this question. Who am I? All I can say is I am. Like who's asking, well, I'm asking the question. So finally I say, who is saying I am? There's no answer, it's emptiness. That's, that's, that's the answer. So let's keep going with that in mind. What I'm doing is I'm stripping away specifics about myself until I get to the root of myself. 
my personality. We're gonna do that with some more complicated systems. So what brought me to this point? How did I get involved with this doc talk? How is this all going on? Really, what it came down to is obsession. You know, I am, I'm, I'm probably not anymore. Maybe I am, it depends on who you ask. I was an obsessive for a long time. I was obsessed with skateboarding for a long time. I just love skateboarding, did it hours and hours every single day until I became what I thought was very good at it. And then after that, I got very obsessed with running. I wanted to do cross country. And so you start to see these patterns of things that I like to do, and I would move on from one after maybe five or six years. I still like to skateboard, I still like to run. Eventually I got really, really into guitar playing, and I became obsessed with that. That eventually took me to uh, Berklee College of Music. You know, it's a jazz school in Boston, fairly well known. That's where Melissa Etheridge went, John Mayer went, the drummer from Aerosmith, a uh, fairly well known place. And while I was at Berkeley, that's where I met this guy on the, uh, this guy on the screen here. This is my, one of my teachers. He became my meditation teacher named Joe Rogers. He's a very relaxed guy. That's why you can see this little bird landing on his shoulder. The bird sees he's a pretty relaxed guy. And so after that, I sort of got into philosophy and religion and psychology. So with all this running, skateboarding, guitar, how did I ever get into statistics and impracticality? Um, maybe this will be starting to become clear, but what statistics does is it gives you a language to link all these things together. That's hopefully what we're gonna talk about as we move through these slides. Okay, so, but very practically, you know, you might say, okay, well, ask this guy on the screen, who is your daddy and what does he do? Okay, talk about the practical applications, what will my son say I do? This is sort of my academic background, and that's, of course, uh, Dr. Romero, she sort of outlined this a little bit, but what I want to keep on reiterating is that there's a lot of variation in the things that I've practiced, and rather than being a jack-of-all-trades, master of none, what I've really strived to be is a jack-of-all-trades, maybe master of patterns, jack-of-all-trades, master of organization, and what I've realized whenever I'm doing any discipline is that the details and the patterns of that discipline can be translated into any other discipline if you look at it from the right perspective. So you think about skateboarding, what is skateboarding? Skateboarding is, in a literal sense, someone gets on a skateboard and rides around, does a trick, right? But is that really what's going on when someone skateboards? Do they skateboard just because they like to roll around and do tricks? No. The reason they do it is because you have something in your mind that you like to do and you see something else that you want to do as well. You want to learn how to do a certain trick. So you spend a lot of time doing this trick, doing this performance, doing this act. Finally, when you do it, you get a rush of adrenaline because yes, I finally did what I wanted to do. Is that literally like almost anything you ever do in life? You have this thing that you want to achieve, you work really hard to do it, and then you succeed and you get a thrill, you get a rush. That's what skateboarding is about. So we take this idea, skateboarding is about really about everything. It's about discipline, it's about learning. So we're starting to see these patterns in various things, how skateboarding is related to everything. Running can be related to everything. What I learned from running, what I learned from running, how to be very, very uncomfortable. I was a cross country runner. I really, really wanted to be on varsity. So I just ran, ran, ran until, until my vision started to go black. You know, you go to that level of discomfort. And what, what does that mean? What does that mean when you're running when you're uncomfortable, your body, your mind will be telling you to stop. Your mind is always telling you to stop, stop, stop. This hurts, this hurts, this hurts. But there's another part inside of yourself that says don't stop. So which part is the real you? Which part keeps you going? That's what running taught me. So you look at all these things in context. So I've got cognition, research, statistics, counseling, evaluation, a very, very broad set of disciplines. What I'm hoping to do tonight is to potentially integrate these things. And that's my son on the screen. Any little reminder, he's pretty cute, right? Okay. Okay, so, you know, I'm always asking myself these questions. What is skateboarding? I'm asking myself these very obvious questions. And I ask my classes very obvious questions. What are numbers? What are words? So here, you know, I'm here, you know, on the little flyer there as a statistician. At UNC, I actually don't consider myself a statistician because our department is so rich in very advanced statisticians. I consider myself a methodologist. Actually, beyond that, I just consider myself a, a systems theorist or a pattern theorist. If I'm at another school where there's not a stats department, everyone thinks I'm a statistician because I work with numbers. But I'm not that high level. But I'm high level enough to be a professor. So, so I'm saying, what is science? What are statistics? What are research methods? What is spirituality? What is religion? What are these questions? So this guy right here on the screen, he's a, a rock star named Andrew W.K. Um, you might know him. He's known for these ham-fisted rock anthems. Uh, most people would say his music uh, you know, seems pretty stupid. 
I like it because I like kind of cartoony things, but what people actually don't know about him, he's actually very, very wise, even though his music is so silly. So he has an advice column, and in his advice column, um, someone wrote in, and it was this sort of scientifically minded uh, atheist person, and the story was, he wrote in, he said, Andrew, Thanksgiving is coming up, and I love science, and I don't really believe in religion or anything like that, uh, but my uncle's gonna come over, and he's gonna wanna do all these things, and I really don't believe in that, so how can I prove to him that he's wrong? And Andrew W.K., a very, very wise person, said, he said, well, actually, let me go back. He said, how can I prove that science is right and religion is wrong? And so Andrew W.K. said, well, both science and religion emerged out of and are aspects of our fundamental search for reality, which is very, very true. Science and research methods really are about what is true, what is real. How can we find out what's really going on? And I think we could argue from a subjective sense and also an objective sense that religion is trying to do the same thing. What is real? What is our relationship with reality? And that's what we're trying to do when we study a hospital. What's really going on? When you study students, what's really going on? What's real? Seriously. I mean, I don't know the answer. I'm asking what's real? What's, re what's reality? So. My whole, my whole talk is guided by questions. So let's say, so what is real or what is reality? You know, it's a cliche, I did it, I went to the dictionary. And so I said, I looked up the definition of real. I thought this was very fascinating. Something that is real is something that has an independent existence on its own. So I can say that this is real because it exists on its own. It's independent, right? You don't need to do anything, this podium just exists, right? Okay, so what is reality? Reality is the quality of being real, or let's see what else we have here. A real event, a real state of affairs, the totality of real things and events. That's what we can call reality. So if we're looking at a totality of real things, you know, we're all real, right? These chairs are real, this room is real. They're independent pieces that come together to form reality. That's the concept that we're getting at here. But they are independent objects, right? So. Let's look at another definition, I like this one. Something that is neither derivative or dependent, but exists necessarily. So what we're saying is, and what this dictionary says, and I think that we can all sort of agree that what is real exists on its own, right? It's independent. That's sort of agreeable, right? That kind of makes sense. Something is real because it just exists on its own, it's independent. It doesn't depend on anything else. So, I'm gonna challenge us for a second. So, what is reality? Let's try an experiment. Where are you right now? I'm gonna ask, ask yourself, think about it in your mind. Where are you right now? Is your location real? Yeah, sure, right? You're in a real spot, right? You're really here? I hope so. You know, or unless I'm, am I dreaming? Is this real? Yeah, you, yeah so you're, you can say your location is real, right? So here's a question. Can you say where you are without relating it to anything else? Can you tell me where you are without relating it to anything else. And so based on that definition we had on the last slide, is your location real? No, but it is, right? It's confusing. So, where, I'm at a doc talk, sure. Where am I? I'm at a doc talk. Now I, my location is in reference to this conversation. So my location is actually not dependent. It's not independent, it's dependent, okay? I'm in Greeley. I'm here in relation to Greeley. Am I in, is that location independent? No, it's dependent. Everything that we communicate about location is dependent. So is our location real? Hmm, I don't know. Like I say, I don't know. This is what you're gonna find out. I really don't know anything. Actually, one of the cleverest things I ever came up with is I only know one thing, and it's that I only know one thing. And that's it, right? So there you go. So let's get a little more specific. We really wanna know where we are. Am I at Zoe's Cafe, 715 10th Street in Greeley? No, I mean, yes, but you know what I mean? That's still relational. That's still relational. So, okay, let's get a little more fancy. What if we wanna talk about distance? We gotta have some sort of measurement to tell where we really are. A measurement's gotta be real, right? No, because distance is always in relation to something. I'm five feet from you, I'm three miles from my house. So, we're again saying what we think is so concrete, our location, so obvious and so given, is actually dependent. And based on the definition of reality, Maybe it's not real. So, I don't know the answer, but I have a lot of questions. So, the only thing that I can actually say, if I really wanna find out where I am, I know where I am, and if you wanna talk about distance, it's zero. The only thing I know about my location is that it's right here in relation to myself, but that's zero, it's unrelatable. My, my location is unrelatable if it's only to myself, right? So, what does that mean? It means that we can only communicate things when we relate them to other things. So, 
I want to talk about this guy a little bit, very briefly. Anyone know who this is just by looks? Probably not. Okay, this is Carlos Castaneda. He was an anthropologist, qualitative researcher. He ended up studying with a, um, a Mexican shaman down in, uh, down in Mexico for a long time, became involved in his practice and things. And he, you know, the Mexican shamans had this very, very interesting approach to things. And they thought that reality was an agreement between people. So here, we have a little quote here. He said that we all have been taught to agree about doing, he said. You don't have any idea the power that agreement bring, brings with us. So you think about social reality, what we're doing. I know this even doesn't, feel, doesn't seem very statistical, right? Not yet, but we're going to get there. Trust me. OK, we're going to talk about numbers. I promise. You're going to love it. Actually, maybe not. We'll see. Hope you do. OK, so but, no, what he's saying is that everything is an agreement. So are we in Zoe's? Well, I don't know. Yes, we can agree that we're in Zoe's, but what if I say we're in a brick room? Is that equally real? Yes. What's my location? We have to agree upon it in order to communicate it. Um, he additionally said that, fortunately, not doing is equally as miraculous and powerful. Mm, that's very interesting. I don't know if I'm going to go there today, but yeah, something to think about. OK, great. So what is agreement? OK, we can say happiness exists, right? Can we agree that there is something called happiness that we all sort of feel sometimes? Here's going to be my question. Here's what it looks like when people agree on happiness. I'm wondering, should these arrows be going up or down? Is it the humans that feel happiness, so happiness exists? Or is happiness something that is inherent that we absorb? So should the arrow be going this way? We are creating happiness, or happiness is something that is inherent in the world that we experience, like the sunlight, or food, nutrition? Um, again, I don't know. But these are very interesting questions to me. And so basically what we have, well, we'll keep going here just a little bit. We're not going to answer these questions, but we'll talk about agreement. We all have to agree that happiness exists in order for it to exist in our social reality. If I have an experience that I can't communicate, it's not an agreement. Um, typically, people think those people are less sane, right? And that's true. People have experiences they can't relate, they can't explain. They keep it to themselves because otherwise people don't, they don't like to hear about it. You know, it makes them be isolated. OK. So I'll show you how we do this statistically a little bit. Here we have something called quality of life. That's what QOL, Q QOL stands for. So this is a statistical model. Um, we use a thing called confirmatory factor analysis, if you want some fancy words. And what we have here is quality of life. Here are some indicators for quality of life. Um, we'll skip overall quality of life. But you can say that general health your activities of daily living, this is actually related to, dis to disability, but it's related to you know, non-disability as well. Your health, what you do every day, how, how you feel about yourself, your self-esteem, your social relationships, your home life, how much energy you have, how much money you have. These are things that have been statistically validated to be very, very strong predictors of quality of life. right? So if you look here, the arrows are actually going from quality of life down into what we call indicators. What this means is that quality of life is a construct that exists independent. And what it does when it exists, it makes these footprints in the way we feel about our social relationships, about our home. And when our experiences of self-esteem, social relationships, home, energy, finances, when those are all sort of in conjunction, they indicate this overarching structure called quality of life. Um, what we use methodologically would call quality of life a construct. A construct is something that can't be observed or measured. You have to see it with what we call indicators. These are indicators, measurements of home, measurements of energy, me measurements of finance. If all these are in conjunction, they indicate quality of life. Um, a silly example I like to talk about with latent variables or constructs, imagine Bigfoot. You know, Bigfoot's a big thing around here in Colorado, right? I'm not from here, but I hear Bigfoot's really like a thing. Like, you know, Bigfoot exists out here, right? I think. OK, so, but nobody can really prove Bigfoot exists. So how do they do that? How do they think Bigfoot exists? But no one's ever really grabbed him and put him in a zoo. So they have indicators. They see bits of his fur. They see his footprints. They hear some howling at night. They, uh, oh, they see that shadowy, that shadowy, grainy footage, right? Those indicate that Bigfoot exists, but no one has actually seen Bigfoot. The same thing works with quality of life. We all know quality of life exists. We all know happiness exists, but we can't actually grab it, take it, put it in a zoo. So this is a model and how this stuff works. This is how we come up with agreement about what's real. OK, so what can we agree on as we've gone up through you know, the slides so far? What can we agree on? We can agree that we all perceive reality. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah sure, why not? Maybe. But 
We all want to communicate about reality. We can definitely get that idea. We want to communicate about reality, and we do that by shared experience, by agreement. And we can't talk about reality without relating it to anything else, which is already contradictory to the definition of reality. Everything in reality should be independent and on its own. But we can't talk about it unless we talk about something else. Isn't that bizarre? I think so. So, what am I doing here? You know, here I am, back with me. It's all about me, right? Right? Well, of course not. But so, um, what do I do here? I look for patterns to communicate reality. That's my job. I look for patterns in reality to communicate. So, I'm going to do a little experiment here. I think I did this in class, so uh, you got the answer. No one else says the answer. You can give the answer. Maybe I don't know. Okay. So, I've got a number sequence here. Can anyone tell me what the next number would be? This is not a math test. Actually, it is extra credit points. Okay. 22. Bingo. You got it. So yes. So you've already, you're already answering my next question. What is the pattern that is generating this sequence? Your ink. You know, every time you go up, you say plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and that's what we got here. This is the pattern that is generating this sequence. What I would call in the bottom line here, these one, two, four, seven, eleven, sixteen, twenty. 22. This is a specific event in reality. Just pretend it's anything that you specifically observe in the world. Then above that, we have the reality generating pattern. The reality generating pattern is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's adding up. It's the distance between the spaces. What's very unique here is this pattern, the specific pattern, 1, 2, 4, the one on the bottom, this starts at 1, but you could take this pattern generating or this uh, sequence generating pattern and start it at 10, start it at 100. It would still work. So what I'm saying is that this pattern can generate specific aspects of reality. Right? Kind of. We go up one level, and there's even a pattern generating that pattern. It's 1, 1, 1, 1. That's the distance between the pattern. Right? So that's what we're going to be talking about as we go through here. We're going to be talking about how specifics in the world can be looked at in patterns. And that's what we're going to be saying. So what does it mean to look for patterns? Well, I kind of just told you. So we're looking for specifics in a situation, and we're looking for patterns. And when we create a pattern, another word for a pattern is a model. So what is a model? Um, what, what is a model, right? We all know what a model is, right? Um, yeah, there's my question. What's a model? Yeah. Right? That's a model. <laughs> Y'all know Fabio, very, very famous model. Uh, he's not very famous anymore, I guess, but he was pretty cool. You know, he had a lot of romance novels. Um, this is actually what I mean when I say what's a model. Um, this is a family stress model. And what this is here is, this is a pattern, a statistical model of the relationship. Right here we have GM means grandmother, and then we have parenting behaviors. We have grandmother distress parenting behaviors, and then we have child distress. The, what the family stress model says, and we all understand it, essentially it says is that when the caregiver is stressed, it's going to affect their parenting, which therefore is going to affect the child's distress, right? We all know that. For anyone who has kids or has worked with kids, when you're all wound up, you can't really interact with your kids as well as you want to, and that might indirectly make them wound up. So what we have here is we have grandmother distress affecting these various aspects of parenting. I'm going to go over these later once I give you more background on the study. And then we have internalizing and externalizing child distress. So why is this a model? Why is this a pattern? Because what this does is it represents what's actually happening in the home across around 350 grandmothers who we use to create this model. And this model has been validated in other studies, and that's how we built it. We built it from somewhere else, from a different family stress model and tested on grandmother, custodial grandmothers. But I'll talk about that later. But why is this a pattern? Because this is not the family that's happening. This is not people interacting. This is not people fighting and feeling stressed. This is not people being happy. This represents that. This is the pattern that generates that specific behavior. That's why that's a pattern generating specific behavior. So how does this work? OK, I'm going to give you an example that I got from probably the most brilliant psychologist I ever met. He was a, uh, he's a career counselor at Kent State University in Mark Savickas. We're going to do a little game here. I'm going to show you a very what I think is a very interesting pattern. So if you would, imagine you go to see a play. What's very special about this play, you see a flyer here at Zoe's or at the rec center or whatever. And the flyer says, come see this play. You, you'll never see anything like it, but you can't know anything about it. You've never, you don't know anything about this play, what it's going to be about. It's a mystery play, but it's going to be great. Trust me. So you sit in your chair. You're looking at the velvet curtain. And all of a sudden, 
you feel a tap on your shoulder, you look over there and it's like, someone says, hey, come on, come over here. And it's an actor. They pull you up on stage behind the curtain. You're behind the curtain and you say, oh, geez, this really is a unique play. All of a sudden, the curtain pulls back and you're on stage with the actors and you say, whoa, what is going on here? So you're like, you really don't know what to do. People are at, walking around, they're you know, talking, these people are fighting, this person is driving, someone came, comes, gives you a bag of trash, you say, oh, oh, trash can, I guess I'll take it over there. You bring over the trash can, drop it off. <clears throat> Eventually, over time, you start to learn how to be in the play. You learn how to play your role, and by the end of the night, after two hours, after intermission, you, you think you've got a good idea who you are, and you know who you are in the play. So this is, this is a great example of what, what does this actually represent? Well, this is what it's like being born. This is what it's like being a baby. You're put into a situation that's brand new. You've never seen this before, and you don't know who you are. You don't know where you are. You learn who you are and where you are by how people interact with you. They tell you who you are. Your parents tell you who you are by how they treat you. You know, it's an, it's a, to me, it's a perfect metaphor. So that's why I credit Mark Savick with that. He's a smart dude. So why does this work? What is happening? What I'm going to start showing you is how these patterns overlay on each other between these two very different situations, being in a theater, being in a play, and being a baby. So what do we have here? We have, OK, first up, we're waiting for the play to begin. That kind of equates with waiting to be born. We have, you're pulled on stage. You're born into a family. The play starts. Your life starts. You have no idea what's going on. You have no idea what's going on. You know, still, you know, this is, are these, is this the same thing? Um, you watch the actors to learn what's going on. You watch the people around you to learn what's going on. Their interactions suggest to you who you are, the actors are telling you. Your interactions with your parents tell you who you are. You figure out your role to play in the play, and you play it. And then lastly, you become who you are based on your experience, right? This is, these are parallel things. They're very, very similar. But we have to ask ourselves the question, are these two things the same? Is being in a play and being a baby the same? Specifically, no. Generally, yes. Why are they the same? What is the pattern generating, or what is the sequence generating pattern that's making these things the same? Why are they the same? Or why are they not the same? Specifically, they're not the same. Generally, yes. You can say they're the same because what they are is they, they're just an event where someone enters an unknown environment and an unknown role and adapts their behavior to survive. That's the, that's the pattern. That's why they're the same. So what we're doing here and what I do in research methods is I look in different situations. I look in counseling. I look in hospitals, schools, books, everything. And I try and find how can I, how can I find what someone's saying to me here and apply it to what I know up here in my statistics, which is the world of patterns. That's how all that stuff works. Okay, yeah, maybe I'm not convinced. You're not, are you, is everybody convinced? Well, if you're not, I got more for you. Just get ready, okay. So now I want you to think of the last movie that you watched. Not your favorite movie, what was the last movie you watched? Imagine the story, the characters, the plot. Uh, now tell me, so what was, what was the movie about? Um, there are a few different approaches for this. When I ask you what the movie is about, am I asking you to tell me the whole script? Is this Lord of the Rings or whatever, or Star Wars? This looks like a, a big one. That's a lot of movies or something. So yeah, I don't want to hear that. But does this equal good guy wins, bad guy loses? Does it? Well, yes and no, right? Kind of, kind of. And of course, yes, good guy wins, bad guy loses. Oh yeah, that's just like that this other movie I've seen. And we do this all the time. You say, oh, that movie's just like this. This artist is just like that. That song's just like that. Are they the same? No, they have similarities. There are these overarching patterns that make them the same, make them similar. So let's look at an example from counseling and see if we can sort of apply this idea to it. So I can't read my monitor from here. I'll read it from here for this small text. A client comes in and reports that they're having difficulty sleeping because they can't stop thinking about their boss in the finance office, and they're also involved in a money-related conflict with their siblings. This sounds like a complicated life situation, right? This sounds like it's probably not too fun to be involved in. So let's take a look at breaking this down into the variables. What do we have here? We have, I can't stop thinking about my job. I can't stop thinking about my family issues. OK, so that's the manifest content of what's going on. I can't stop thinking about these things. And because of that, I'm having a hard time sleeping. OK, excuse me, that's very nice. And then because of this, it's affecting my quality of life. So we can start seeing these things being broken down into tiers of pattern. We can say, 
essentially that these are the manifested sort of things that are causing the sleep, which are causing the quality of life. And now we're gonna start breaking down, once we start breaking things down to these tiers of patterns, we can start thinking about how we want to intervene and how we want to affect them. And so when you're working in program evaluation, which is what I do, um, you're looking at a hospital, a very, very complicated system with one problem. Or imagine you're a counselor working with a patient. A patient comes into you with, or a client, comes into you with these problems, where do you act? Where is the problem? Is the problem that they can't stop thinking? Is that they can't sleep? Or is that the quality of life is going down? Where do you think is most important? Where do you act as the counselor? All, all approaches are legitimate and there are fields of medicine for each. So, one intervention could be applied to your job or family. Why don't you try and fix something about your job? Why don't you talk to the guy in finance? Why don't you talk to your family about the money issue? That would be an intervention at that level. How about at the sleeping level? How about you do some meditation or some yoga before you go to sleep? Is the problem what's going on in your work or is the problem that you can't sleep? Or is the problem about your quality of life? Where is the problem? Literally, where is the problem? What, you know, because you, you gotta act on one, you gotta act somewhere. Okay, or can we do an intervention on the quality of life? How about you exercise? That improves people's quality of life. Why don't you eat better? Why don't you try meditating or something? So. This is the question, where do you apply the intervention? And this will come back around when we look at the grandmothers um, in this other model. So this is a counseling situation. Let's look at it in a hospital. A hospital is having difficulties in a heart disease uh, unit. The heart disease patients, uh, having a heart dent, the patients won't take their medicine and do their diet routines. Um, as a result, the department is overburdened with repeat patients, which is slowing down the intake and care for new patients. So why is this important? Well. Because hospitals exist on two levels, and many things ex exist on two levels. Hospitals in particular, they exist in an altruistic level, where their job is to do no harm and make people feel better, improve people's lives, but they still have to make money. Money is what sort of funds that thing going. So, we have the hospital can't serve people, which means they aren't really, they're overburdened with repeat clients, they're not actually helping any new people with their hearts but they're also not getting any new patients, new insurance reimbursements in that system. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So one level, the very basic, obvious level, patients aren't taking their medication, patients aren't following their diet. Yeah, that's happening. Um, so that is causing the cardiac department to be overburdened. And because of that, the hospital is losing clients in a general sense, cardiac patients. Okay, so we could look at interventions applied to patients. Maybe if we had some sort of counseling session with the doctor said, you know, you really gotta eat your medicine, you really gotta lower your salt intake, you really gotta do those things. Maybe that would do it. Maybe the problem is at the cardiac level. Maybe we shouldn't, maybe, you know, human behavior is very, very difficult to change. Anybody who has ever tried to diet or exercise or change their own behavior, very, very difficult. Imagine changing someone else's behavior. You can only do it if you force them to do it, pretty much. Otherwise, it's very, very, very difficult. So why don't they just expand the size of the cardiac department or, or get more doctors and more offices? Hmm, that might work, that would solve the problem, right? Maybe we can look at the hospital. The hospital is losing clients. Maybe we can do a hospital level intervention. I don't know what a hospital level intervention is. I haven't worked in enough hospitals to know what that would look like, but maybe they would build a new building. I don't know. But the idea here, it doesn't necessarily matter what you do at the hospital, but that your intervention can be applied to these different levels. And it's all because we're looking at the patterns, what's causing what. Okay, so are my counseling program, are my counseling and program evaluation stories the same? Um, actually, they seem pretty different, more different than the, than the theater baby example, right? But let's take a look at it. So have a problem at work and in family. Have a problem in the cardiac department. Something is not functioning the way it should be functioning. Work and family are not working the way I want. My life, I want my life to be good. I want my work to be good. I want my family life to be good. Something in there is not working. This system is not functioning. Patient outcomes are not what we want. The system is not working. Our patients are not doing what we want them to work. My, my family's not working. The patients aren't working. It's affecting my sleep. I can't sleep. And it's affecting the functioning of the department. Patient, you know, doctors are annoyed. Why does this person keep coming in? I told them to stop smoking. They're still smoking, uh, that sort of thing. The quality of life is, my quality of life is decreasing. The overall metric that I use to see the, my life, my quality of life is decreasing. The most important thing in my life is my quality of life. It's decreasing. And for a hospital, you know, 
their quality is receiving, they're, reviewing, they're getting fewer and fewer patients. And a hot, for, for a hospital, patients are like, that's what it's all about, serving patients. That's really their most important thing. So less happy, more negativity in my life, with my quality of life, and we're really not affecting heart disease. So are these things the same? No, but when we break them down, we start to see the patterns and how they affect each other. And so we start to see these parallel systems. We pull these things apart. And we pull these things apart, that's when we can start seeing the moving parts and actually apply comparisons and methods, which we will get into, I promise. Okay, so why does this work? Why does it work? Why are we able to see these patterns and things? <clears throat> why? Any ideas? No, not really. Yeah. Anyone have any ideas? Well, why? Why? What's the, what's the overarching pattern that's causing these patterns? This meta pattern. You know, we had our 1, 2, 4 all the way up to 22. We have our 1, 2, 3 causing that pattern. We have the 1, 1, 1 causing the 1, 2, 3, 4. So why do these patterns exist in hospitals, patients, and other things? What's the third level pattern? Why? Because humans and hospitals and anything you can think of can be considered a system. A system is... No, oh, yeah, what is a system? You know, like I say, I ask a lot of questions. A system is an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way that achieves something. Ugh, that's a mouthful. I hate these sorts of definitions because they're so cumbersome to me. But you get the idea. A system is a collection of things that are working together to achieve something together. So in that sense, you could call your human body, your psychology, that's a system. You're trying to live your life and be happy. Your hospital is a system, a school is a system. Literally, any collection of objects that are unified in a goal are a system. You can even say this cup is a very simple system. It has water and it has plastic, and its purpose is to hold water so I can drink it. The system is achieving its goal. Okay, so what composes a system? What is the third level pattern that's causing these systems to relate? Well, systems have elements. Elements are the items that make up a system. So the system of the cup, the system is the water, the plastic, I guess even my hand, is part of the system of the cup. Those are the elements, the moving parts. We have interconnections, relationships between elements. So you can also think about a beehive, a hospital, literally anything. You got the bees, you got the house, you got the honey, you got the queen. Then you get their relationship. So the relationship here between the cup and the water is that the cup holds the water, right? The patients go to the hospital. That's the interconnection, that's the relationship. And then beyond that, what's the purpose of a relationship? Why do relationships exist? Hmm? Why, why? Like why would anything be related? Why? Because it has a function or a purpose. These, this cup and this water only exist because they serve a purpose. Their purpose dictates their relationship, and the relationship is what causes these elements to come together, right? So we have purpose. Purpose is very important because it causes connection and it causes elements. Um, this is a very interesting point that I got from a book on systems theory, that function or purpose is not necessarily expressed explicitly. Watch for a while to see how the system behaves. So what that means is that if you're looking at a system, you're looking at a collection of objects, you might not know what its purpose is, and it won't tell you either. The purpose is not in what it says it does, the purpose is in what it does, right? So you might have a politician, you might have a boss, you might have someone who says, this is our goal, this is what we're doing, but is that actually what their function is? Is that actually their purpose? Mm, not always, not always, right? So you gotta think about that. What's actually going on here? So we're talking about systems. They're interconnected elements, that have relationships that serve a purpose. I'm a system, Zoe's is a system, Doc Talks are a system, what are they trying to achieve? Um, we had a great example, I think Doc Talks are great, I love the Greeley Creative District, it seems like a very cool thing, you know, pumping this creativity in the community and everyone gets to share things, I really like it. That's the purpose, our interconnections, our relationship, where are the elements, very cool stuff. So, what's the purpose of looking at things this way? How is this useful? Why do we even care? I mean, seriously, why are we even talking about systems? Why are we talking about research? Why is this even interesting? So if you understand the pieces of something, you can look for solutions to questions or problems, right? That's, why, that's what it's all about. You wanna answer something. You wanna explain something. You wanna predict something. You wanna understand the world. And even then, you say, why do you wanna understand the world? Why do I wanna understand the world? Well, because there are some things I don't get about it. Well, my, you know, Joe Rogers, you go back to my teacher there, I text him all the time these questions I have, and his default response, he's very consistent. I would say, 
you know, Joe, I'm really stressed about this or I'm wondering about this experience I had and his default answer is typically, who is having the experience? And so I have to say, well, I am, you know, okay, I am, whatever, I got you. I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, okay. Who is I am? Oh, okay, I get it. Um, but it's very true, all right, it's very, very true. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to answer a question, answer a problem. We wanna put the pieces together to understand our lives better. And you know, when you're talking about working in a hospital, trying to understand a school, trying to understand a government, you think you're doing it in a global sense, in an environmental sense, but in reality, you're trying to put together the pieces of your own life. You're trying to understand something because it's meaningful to you. It's very subjective. So, very, very cool stuff. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to put the pieces together using patterns, using systems, oops, 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 okay, using observation. So, we'll enter in statistics, enter in numbers. I told you we get there, right? Now we're gonna start talking about statistics. And now I'm gonna throw another little loop for you. What is statistics? And I say what is statistics rather than what are statistics because I'm saying what is statistics as a topic. So, yes, um, we use numbers. That's a given, right? We know statistics use numbers. So, but I wanna ask you, what are numbers? Seriously. I mean, you think you know what numbers are, right? We know what two is, we know what three is, we think we know what numbers are, but what, what are numbers for? Because you can't really know what something is unless you know what it's for, typically. So what are numbers? They're, they're symbols. They're symbols used to represent degrees of differences between things. You know, two, and I, I, and I, I emphasize that symbols they're symbols designed to represent the degrees of difference between things because numbers are only used to measure di differences. The reason I say that is because, just like if you wanna go back to our location example in the, in the earlier slides, two by itself is meaningless, it's a shape. I'm trying to do this backwards, you guys can see it, but I can't. Okay, so two is meaningless. Two only has value if you have the, if you have the number zero. Isn't that interesting? Remember, we were talking about, I think I'm all these things, but then you go deep into I am, and then you realize that there's nothing, but everything else is only in relation to my concept of myself. So, two is the same way. The number two only exists because the number zero exists. Otherwise, two would have no value. It would have no distance. It has no meaning, right? So, we use numbers to do that. Three, we know three is a magnitude of three things, three things greater than nothing. So. Let's look at these assorted uh, colorful balls here. What if we wanted to compare these? What if we wanted to start looking at the differences between things? Because that's really what we're trying to do with statistics and research methods. We're trying to explain variation. We're trying to explain differences. We're trying to explain everything. So how can I, com how can I compare these two different sets of balls? I can't compare their colors. I can't really compare their shapes. That's not consistent. There's no pattern here. I mean, they're all spherical, but this one's stripes, these ones got little you know, hooks on it to attach to a Christmas tree. The only way I can do it is with numbers. So this one's eight, and this one's nine. And now I've got a pattern that I can use to look across these two different systems. Otherwise, these were colorful sort of bocce balls for playing bocce ball in the dark. In the dark. And there's Christmas ornaments. How can you compare bocce balls and Christmas ornaments? You can't. The only way you can is by quantity, by numbers. So this is where numbers start to have practical application and, implement, and implementation. So what do we do with numbers? How do we use numbers to understand things? Well, there are essentially five things that we can do. I'm gonna talk about all of them a little bit. We can use numbers to describe something. We can use numbers to compare things. We can use them to look at relationships, to predict things, to explain things. And I'm gonna see if I can take us through this idea here. So, you got a little mountain here. Can we describe this mountain? Yeah, it's kind of pointy, kind of grayish, black and white. Yeah, very interesting. Um, but what if we wanna compare it to this mountain? Okay, we can say one's bigger than the other. That's very interesting, but we're not talking about words, we're talking about numbers. So, in order to well, actually what we're doing first is we're describing it. With this one's tall and pointy, this one's kind of round and flat. Uh, pretend they're in the same mountain range, you know, just for argument's sake. So we can compare them, we can, or we can describe them, but in order to compare them, this is a very useful metric to compare them. What's their height? What's the height of the mountain compared to the other one? Okay, so that's an example of a comparison based on height. Now, um, this up here, this is a, a 
ice swimming team, and what they do is they hike up mountains in shorts with no shirts, as you can see. So we were talking about comparisons. We can compare mountains with height, with, with measurement. Now we can talk about relationships. What is a relationship as opposed to a comparison? A comparison is which mountain is taller. A relationship might be how far can this mountain team get up each mountain? That would be a relationship. The height of the mountain determines how far the team goes. Just say the mountain is very, very tall. The team, maybe they can only climb up to eight I don't know, 800 feet, 8,000 feet, I'm not sure. But we start to look at relationships, and relationships are the way that things change together. So as the height goes up, the mountain team gets colder and colder. They have a harder and harder time. We're looking at the way things change together. Okay, we can also do prediction. We can start to predict, well, based on what I know about this mountain team and the relationship about the height of the mountain and how cold it gets, I'm gonna predict they can only get so high. So we have prediction. We also have what we call explanation. Explanation is when you have that something that happens and you want to describe how it happened. So here's we have, here we have, okay, this, this guy went too high. Actually, he got lost. He went over in Estes Park, and I think he was in a hotel for a little while, and he sort of went crazy. Uh, they wrote a book about it. So basic summary. So let's look at description a little more thoroughly. So with description, we have... Um, we want to basically look at what are the magnitudes of the elements of the system. How are things, how do things compare to each other? Um, so what we have here, I'm not sure if you can see that too well. What we have here is a basic demographics chart of the grandmothers there in the study. So I guess now is a good time for me to tell you about this study. So I have to explain first, before I tell you about the study, I have to explain what custodial grandmothers are. If you don't know, custodial grandmothers are grandmothers who take care of their grandchildren. A uh, custodial grandfather would be a grandfather who takes care of their grandchild. So this is a situation that's very common. Usually it happens for a reason that is not so fun. Usually the parents are out of the picture for some reason and the grandparents have to take over. Um, it's a huge burden to take on a young child at that late of age. And it's also an, addi an additional burden because there's something wrong with your child that made it so they couldn't care for their own child. So it's like a double dose of stress. So it's a very, very vulnerable population, um, very meaningful to study, very rewarding to look into. But what I wanna do with our description is I wanna look at this data we have here. Because again, the data, uh, represents patterns, and patterns are not the specific situation, but what they do is they kind of tell us what's going on in the families and what's going on in the environment. So let's look at some of this data. Um, we can basically see uh, up here we have, let's see, uh, well, you can't see it up here, but the ad average, grade, average age of the grandmother, oh, you can't see that, the average age of the grandmother was 51, interesting. The average age of the grandchild was 7.8. Um, the number of children that the grandmothers were typically caring for was almost two. That's fairly typical. So why are the grandmothers, and you know, once you start looking at the data, you can start asking yourself questions. Why is this pattern occurring? And this is the most fun part. This is what I like about looking at data. You can start to interpret it and sort of infer what might be going on. So why, why would the grandmother be caring for two children typically? Well, that's because that's the most frequent number of children that people have. Pretty, pretty simple answer, not that interesting actually. Um, you can look at ethnicity. Um, that's more dependent on where we collected our sample from. We got them from Ohio, California, Baltimore, and Texas. Um, education, this is actually kind of interesting. This is a little interesting. So of all the custodial grandmothers, you can see the most frequently occurring value is that they had some college. 43% went to college, but didn't finish for some reason. So, you know, you're starting to get a picture. Something is going on in their life that they weren't able to complete. A large portion of these grandmothers weren't able to complete their goal of going to college. Interesting, we're getting an idea. You can see income. Um, the grandmothers typically make between, uh, between 15. Well, let's say we add these two things up. Uh, it's about, what, about 40%. So almost half are making less than $45,000 per year. And that's the family income, that's not just the grandmother income. So, you know, you get to see there what's going on. And the average age is 51, so they're not retired. So just think about that. And now we have relation to grandchild. This is where you can actually start to see some patterns start to emerge. Um, the overwhelming majority, they were caring for their daughter's child. Now, I don't know the answer for this. I'm not a uh, family expert, but I do assume that it's much easier for a father to leave a family relationship than it is for a mother. 
I think that might be the more common thing, and that's if you look at this data, that is actually more common. What this data is telling you is that it's more likely that the dad's out of the picture because they're caring for the daughter's child, not caring for the father's child. That's kind of an interesting pattern. Another very interesting thing, you can see the reason for care. Um, the biggest reason for care is drug abuse. The parents are doing drugs. You think this is gonna stress the parents out? Oh yeah, for sure. It's not just they're caring for the kid, but they're, their kid is uh, out of the picture because they're addicted to drugs. They're also pretty likely to be in jail and mental illness, drug abuse in jail. These things go together pretty heavily. So we're getting a picture of what's going on. This is, so what we're doing here is we're finding patterns. These patterns are not in a specific situation, but if we were to look in the family's homes, this is more, most likely what would be going on. That's what this data is telling us. It's not the specifics, it's the pattern. This is what we're seeing. Okay, so we'll move on, talk about comparisons. What's the difference between two or more things? How can we compare things? Now, this is a different study. This, um, I'm gonna go back to your grandmothers because that's pretty interesting, I can tell. Um, now we're talking about the differences between teaching style. This is geology classes. We had three different types of teaching. We had a data class where the students would get data about geology and do analyses and learn. Then we had a lecture only class where the teacher just gets up and talks. And then we have lab and lecture where they went out into the river and they got this very wonderful isotope reading machine. The logic behind that was that if you give these kids who wanna be geologists this uh, fancy machine, they get to go splash around the river in the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. Um, that was the one that caught on fire famously in Cleveland. Um, just, yeah. FYI, um, they're gonna love it. So the hypothesis for this whole study was that those who get the lab and lecture are gonna love everything way more. So the way these colors are distributed, it's a little tricky to see, but there's oranges, yellows, and whites. If the colors are different, that means that these values are significantly different. That means they're meaningfully different. So let's take a look at some of our difference here. We have the perception, oops, where, okay, there we go, good. We got the perception of choice, that means the measurement of how much the students felt like they had a choice over the direction of the class. They rated the lecture only class the highest, in meaning that when they asked a question, they could steer the direction of the course. That pattern actually makes a lot of sense. When you're in the lab, when you're in the field, you can't change the direction of the data, you can't change the direction of the procedure, so the perception of choice was much higher in a, la in a lecture only classroom. Uh, what we also have here, is we have motivation. Um, what you can see here is that the lab group had significantly lower motivation scores or motivation of control. This means that they felt like the situation was out of their control. Um, so this was significantly lower than all the other groups. So why did the lab group feel like they didn't have control and they weren't motivated to get control? I'm gonna tell you, once we start to see these patterns, I'm gonna tell you the story that actually happened that caused these numbers. And then last here, we have task value change. So what this means, when you're asked to do something, like just anyone ask you, and maybe your parents when you were younger asked you to do something, you say, uh, is this really worth doing? Should I be doing this? That's the task value. Or if you're doing something for yourself, you might say, oh, this is a really good idea, I really wanna do this. High task value. And so we have pre-test and post-test. Unfortunately, all the students saw task value change at the end of the semester. At the end of the semester, they were sick of it. They thought, mm, this is not as interesting as I thought it was, but the lab group thought this is really less, less meaningful and less uh, interesting than I thought it was. So what's going on here? I mean, this sounds like it was a great idea. Lab and lecture, let's go, I mean, I wanna be a geologist, let me splash around, collect some dirt samples. That sounds really wonderful. Um, what I'll tell you here is that the, the person who is running the lab group had a scheduling error it was an overnight hotel stay that they had to go out in the river and collect these things. There was a scheduling error and because of some sort of personality conflicts, everyone in that group ended up hating him and hating the whole process. So that's why they thought the task value was low. That's why they felt like they didn't have any control and, uh, and that's why all that stuff happened. So once we see the pattern, once we get the story, we can see how the pattern is dictating what actually happens. Okay, let's look at relationships. How do things interact? Okay, these are kind of fun. These are correlations. How do two things occur? So what we have here is we have the total revenue generated by arcades, video game arcades, and we have, in red, and we have computer science doctoral degrees awarded in the US. As you can see, over time, these things are pretty much happening exactly the same. 
The more PhD degrees they hand out in computer science, the more money arcades are making. Does this, you know, can you, can you kind of guess why that makes sense? Yeah, sure, people who like computers probably like video games. So the more people who are sort of getting into games, they probably go play video games more. They want to make games, computer science degrees, they can also do video game design. But it makes sense, these people like technology, they like video games. Try this one, this one's a little harder. All right, we have per capita consumption of chicken, and we have total US crude oil imports. So who, when they go buy chicken at King Supers, also buys a bucket of oil, right? <laughs> These things don't appear to be correlated, but they might have a common cause. What might their common cause be? Well, crude oil imports are an indication of economic activity, and chicken, for some, meat is more of a luxury item. The more money the government has, the more money the economy has, the more money people probably spend on chicken and meat, as opposed to cheaper things like rice or beans or vegetables. So you can start to see why these correlations are happening. You can see these patterns. Okay. Now I want to talk about explanation. Why is explanation important and what is explanation? We all want to explain things. Why do we want to explain things? We want to say, why did this happen? Why did something happen? You know, I come home and uh, I don't know, my son's screaming on the floor, like, what happened? What's the explanation? And a mathematical model for this might be, two plus y equals four. Four might be my son upset when I get home, but I want to know, you know, when I left, he was a two. When I came, he was a four, what happened here? What's the explanation? So this is a diagram for that sort of explanation. We have something that goes in, we don't know what happened, and we've got an output. We can see the output, we can see the input, we want to explain what happens. That's an explanation. Okay, we also have prediction. We have the same sort of model. We have two plus two, but we want to know what it equals. If you put two things together, what's going to happen? And this happens all the time with prediction, like matchmaking. What if I have two friends and I get them together? Are they going to fall in love? I don't know, maybe, maybe. So that's prediction. So here we've got a little thing. Let's look at this predictive model. We have kids in class. Let's add something to that. Let's add some puppies and a box. Mm, yeah, kids, look, kids, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think you can predict what's going to happen? Uh, what's it equal? Oh, well, that's interesting. Is that what you thought? That's not what I thought. But I made the slide, so of course that's what I thought. But, so that's prediction. So let's look at a real world complex example. Let's look at this family stress model and talk about how we had comparisons, relationships, predictions, and, expl ex and explanation. So what we had here with this model, we have the relationship between grandmother distress, parenting practices, and grandchild distress. We have internalizing and externalizing. Externalizing is when you yell and scream and you can see it. Internalizing is you're sad, lonely, and depressed. So we're looking, the, the hypothesis is that grandmother distress, her anxiety and depression, will influence the child's anxiety and depression, but their parenting practices will somehow be related in this whole thing. So why is this a comparison? Because we have three interventions that we tested. Our three interventions were a mental or cognitive behavior intervention where we had some grandmothers go to a cognitive behavior support group where they learned how to manage their internal dialogue. And the idea was that, that we were gonna reduce their distress. Because if they can manage the way they think, maybe they can manage their emotions better. So that was the idea, that one would affect that. We also had a parenting support group where the grandmothers would get together and share parenting stories, learn parenting practices. The idea was that that was going to affect parenting practices. So if the cognitive behavior one makes grandmas feel happier and less stressed, that will improve their parenting. And also, see these lines going here? That'll also reduce grandchild distress. The parenting one, you know, parenting obviously, the way you parent a child directly influences how the child feels. So the parenting intervention was going to affect their parenting and then affect the child's behavior. So what we, what we did then, we ran the different groups, we ran all these tests, and we compared the differences between these relationships. That was a comparison. And what we did find was that the cognitive behavior group, that did reduce grandmother distress, and that did reduce grandchild distress, and even affected parenting a little bit. And then when we ran the parenting group, we did find that it affected parenting and directly affected grandchild distress, but also parenting, to a degree, indirectly affected grandmother distress because when they were a better parent, they had better control over the environment, they, everything just sort of went better. But why is this important? Remember a few slides back, I was looking at these tiers of where do you apply the intervention in psychology? Where do you apply the intervention in the hospital? That's what this means. What do you want to affect? Do you want to affect the, the grandmother's well-being? Do you want to affect her parenting? It's very, very important. You need to know where you want to affect in this whole system. It's not just the whole story that 
grandmothers are stressed out, they're having a hard time parenting in the modern world, and the kids are, are sad, you've got to break it down into its little patterns and little pieces so you know where you want to affect something. If you want to make the grandmothers happier, if that's your goal, if that's where you think the problem is, give them some cognitive behavior therapy. If you think it's really about the parenting because you really are more interested in affecting the kids and making their lives easier, maybe you want to do a parenting intervention. So being pointed, being specific, knowing exactly what you want to do in a system is very, very important. Okay, so let's look at real life examples of statistics in statistics patterning. And we've talked about these in a very general sense. We talked about hospitals, counseling situations, but what if I want to apply this to my own life? What if I want to think about myself in this way? Uh, so let's, this is not me, this, let's pretend this is this person looking at the way. She's having a rough time. So how do I choose between jobs? I've got two job offers, I'm so lucky, but how do I choose which one is better? That's a comparison. I want to see which one is better. She's doing comparison. So why is this significant? Because you think everything in your life is very specific, very unique, and it is, as applied to you. However, it's the pattern that's generating it is, is a pattern, is general. This is a comparison, we do it all the time. How do I compare between jobs? How do I pick between them? That's a comparison. Why do I get stressed whenever I talk to my family about my career? Hmm. Why, when I do something, does something else happen? That's a relationship. Why does one thing cause another? Why, when I talk about this, why do I get, it? Why do I get stressed? I want to understand, we want to understand how certain things affect other things. Why when two people interact, they always fight? Why when two people interact, do they always get along? Have this relationship. You can also say, why is my life such a mess? That's our equation, two plus two equals what? We don't, oh no, that's actually two plus what equals four. My life is a mess, that's the outcome. I want to find out why. I want to understand the composition of something. I want to explain, I want to explain. That's what the statistic says. Remember, comparing relationships, um, explanation, prediction. What will my life like be like in 10 years? These are all very, very common questions. This is prediction. What, I want to predict what will happen. What will happen? What will life be like? And the reason I'm sort of giving this person's example, this could be, you know, it could be a very real life thing that's happening with this person, is everything we've looked at, everything we've talked about is actually the same thing. It's all the same system. It's all the same idea. Even you look back at me when I'm looking at skateboarding, statistics, Cognitive behavior therapy, counseling, evaluations, you know, everything. What's actually happening? Are all these things interrelated or are they independent? Um, what we kind of find out with our reality thing, re real things should be independent, but we kind of find out we can't talk about it, we can't interrelate things unless they are dependent on other things. So why do we ask questions? Why do we want to know things? How are we trying to figure out the world if it's about a hospital or if it's about our family or if it's about anything? Usually it's because we're curious. If you're curious, that's actually a great position to be in because you're going to benefit, you're enjoying the process of learning. That's what curiosity is. Something we want to know more about. Being curious is a very lovely thing. Um, but more, not more often, sometimes we want to ask questions because we have a problem. That's more day to day. We have a problem, we wanna find out what's going on, we have something that we want to change. So, who wants to know? You know, that's what we're coming down to, who wants to know? Who wants to know the answer? So, that guy Mark Savick, I see a pretty smart guy, like I said, he said, and I believe it, when someone asks you a question, they tell you more about how they see the world than your answer says about you, right? So if someone says like, why do you like, why do you like Kiss, you know, the band? That, you could say, well, you could give them the reason, and that's a very limited answer, but why they're asking you the question, they don't understand why somebody would like KISS, right? So when someone asks you a question, they're telling you more about themselves than they could ever hope to get from your answer. I thought that was pretty insightful. So when we're looking at other people, people ask us questions, they're telling us what they think. They're, they're trying to find out what we think, but they're actually telling us what we think. I'm sorry, they're telling us what they think. So take that concept and why do you want to know something? Why are you asking questions? What are you trying to figure out? It's not just you're trying to figure out something, but what part of the world do you want to decode? What do you actually want to figure out? And why does that even need to be figured out? That's the important question. It's not necessarily the answer, but one step back, the pattern, generate, what, the pattern that generates the question is why does this even need to be a question? That's a second level pattern generating the question. So now we're back, who wants to know? I'm gonna sort of finish this up with this idea of a light cone. It's an idea from physics. A light cone is a very interesting idea. What we have here is a point. This is the present moment. And what we have here is everything in the world that contributed to this one event happening. 
So for example, we're all here right now in this room, an incalculable amount of things had to happen for this event to happen. And if you think about it from a probability standpoint, the probability of something happening is perfect. Something will always happen. But what is the probability that we are all here? Almost zero. The odds that all of this came together to actually occur is almost impossible. Think about it. All those moving parts, almost impossible. So what we have here in this light cone is the present moment. And then after the present moment, this is everything that that present moment will touch in space. Here is everything that could have touched that based on the speed of light to the present moment. And then here's everything that that will touch as it goes into space. And then we have another example of a light cone. And this, I like this because it sort of represents coming down in patterns. Coming down in patterns until you find the root of something. So we're talking about the present moment, but what is the root of the question? We have the answer, we have the solution, we have the specifics, but what's the root of the question? So yeah, who wants to know? I do. Okay, who is saying I do? I am, right? Here we are again. Who's saying I am? Uh, here we are again. And that's it. That's all it is. So that's my presentation. That's my doc talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>